Welcome to the lecture on optimization methods for machine learning and engineering. In this course you will learn how to use new superpowers. Because in this course you will learn how to take optimal decisions. Not, not just any kind of decision, but really the best decision. And this has applications in many different fields. So, for example, in daily life, how to best invest your money. Or in an engineering context, what are the best control settings for an airplane. But also in a machine learning context, for example, what is the best model for a given set of observations. So, optimization is the, is the main topic of this uh, lecture and uh, we will have many different application examples to, to guide you through the theory but always to have it accompanied with a lot of examples that are hopefully exciting and that you will like as much as we did in preparation of this lecture. My name is Julius Pfrommer. I'm head of a research group at Fraunhofer EUSB in Karlsruhe. Uh, prior to that I did my PhD in, in computer science and uh, before that, my original topic of study was um, engineering and economics. Um, and uh, what we do in my research group is we apply artificial intelligence methods to achieve improvements in the real world. So we are mostly interested in physical systems or cyber physical systems that um, are, for example, large scale production systems and uh, we want to learn something about these types of systems and then use the models to uh, make decisions and to have a, a real-world impact. And uh, optimization is a major part of that for the learning of models, but later then also for the, for the decision-making at runtime. So today, the agenda for today is to have a, a motivation and a historical perspective on optimization. So, how, how old is this topic and uh, how was it developed over the years? What are some of the major uh, challenges and the major applications that were solved with the, with the tools for optimization? We will have a section on the, the course organization. So um, what are you expecting not only today, but for the next 14 lectures? Then we will have a small refresher on uh, mathematics and uh, especially analysis today. So this will be not a complete course in mathematics, but it will remind us some of the topics from our earlier studies and uh, will also introduce the notation that is used in this course. And then we have uh, two final topics. The first one on convexity. Convexity is one a very important uh, well, characteristics of optimization problems. And uh, gradient descent, gradient descent will be the first tool, the first algorithm we will learn how to solve actual optimization problems. So, jumping into the first chapter on uh, motivation and historical perspective, uh, what you see here is one of the first examples where actual optimization was used, and also in the mathematical sense, and also where machine learning was used. So, this topic goes by many, many years. Uh, goes back many years to the early 19th century, so in around 80, beginning 1800 something, uh, where Giuseppe Piazzi published observations of a newly discovered planet or dwarf planet uh, called Ceres. And um, he had several observations uh, on different days where he found the planet in, in the sky and uh, then Ceres was lost. And the big question was whether um, astronomers were able to predict the orbit so that they could recover or refine Ceres when it came back into view from, from the Earth. And uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss, a famous mathematician, he was able to compute the orbit of Ceres. So he was able from the observations to compute a model that predicted the new location. And uh, as you maybe know, all planets are on an elliptic orbit around the Sun. So their orbits are pretty simple. The problem is that Earth is also on an elliptic orbit around the Sun, and therefore the movement of Ceres from the point of view of the Earth is a, looks a little bit random, uh, and you see this here depicted in the, in the upper right image. But Gauss actually was able to, to do the calculations to fit a model onto these noisy observations, and for this he invented a method that we call today the least squares method. And this is an important tool in optimization. And in general, what he did, fitting observations or fitting model parameters to 
represent well given observations. Today we call this empirical risk minimization and this is also one, one of the categories of, of machine learning that researchers are talking about. So many machine learning techniques are actually solutions or algorithms that solve an optimization problems. And, and sometimes this is explicit, sometimes this is a little bit hidden in the background, but having this understanding and having this perspective helps us a lot in uh, well, getting an intuition, intuition what, these, what these tools do. So going forward a couple of years, we are now in the early 1900, in the early 20th century. Uh, the, the US Army was interested in developing low-cost diets to keep their soldiers alive. So the big question is, um, if, we have, if we know how many nutrition the soldiers need every day, how many calories, how many proteins, how much calcium and so on, how can we feed them with a combination of uh, ingredients that is as cheap as possible but lets the soldier live? And um, there uh, were at the time lists of the ingredients, the different ingredients and what they contain. So for example, um, um, uh, meat or milk or grain or mice, um, how much protein, how much calcium and so on does it contain. And um, there were previous attempts to do this kinds of optimization and they came to publish diets that cost about $100 per year in the day. So back in the day in the early 1930s. And um, then George Stiegler approached this with a mathematical perspective and uh, he looked at this as something that we call today a linear uh, optimization problem where we're looking for a linear combination of the different ingredients that are just barely above the minimum for, for all the different categories of, of um, nutrition that we need or that the soldiers need. And um, George Stiegler worked on this together with nine clerks, so people who were doing the calculations by hand, and they worked on this for 120 person days and came up with a solution that is actually pretty close to the global optimum. So today we have uh, improved this a little bit. There were some slight errors in there, um, but they came about to a cost of about uh, $40 per year. So they had a more than two times improvement over the previous published result. And uh, you see here a stickler solution, so a lot of wheat flour and a lot of milk, cabbage, spinach and dried navy beans. The solution is a little bit different if we allow um, that meat is in contained because then there will be liver involved. Liver is very high in, in iron and therefore um, the, the solution if we allow meat also contains some liver. And uh, today this kind of optimization problem, a linear problem, can be solved really in, in milliseconds. So our computers barely break into a sweat to solve this kind of a problem, which back in the day took 120 person days to solve. And um, this is really interesting. So um, we see how an actual problem that has importance because when there are hundreds of thousands of soldiers feeding them costs a lot of money, um, how such problems can be cast in a mathematical way and then solved. Uh, the problem here is that the solution is correct, so you are actually fulfilling the minimum requirements for the soldiers for every day. However, there are some, some side conditions that cannot be captured in the mathematical model. Here it's, for example, that the solution was never applied because it's just bad for morale. If you're eating the same every day and it's mostly beans, then life is no fun. And um, so this is then a side constraint that uh, couldn't be integrated into the mathematical model. And there's a, a somewhat funny account of that. So uh, a paper by George Danzig that you see here below, where he, um, he recalls uh, during the development of the optimization uh, algorithms, how he told his wife to cook him daily a meal with the results from his computer and uh, the, different, the different mishaps that uh, were generated there. In general, optimization has become a tool, so not only to compute uh, optimal diets, but in many different fields of engineering, we are interested in, in the best solution and we have actually ways to express our problem in, in a mathematical way. And uh, especially engineers are using this. And a very common optimization problem there is to say, for example, we want to minimize cost. So uh, what you see here in the, in the upper example, um, this is a bridge 
uh, crossing over, over a river, for example, and uh, the green arrows pointing down, these are the loads, so gravity and trains going over the bridges and so on. And uh, these, the, the bridge has to hold at least this load. And uh, the, the, the question then is, how light can we make the bridge and how cost effective can we make the bridge so that it holds the load, doesn't break down, and uh, here we have uh, performance constraints. So we are minimizing cost. The cheapest solution would be to have no bridge at all, but we have some constraints. We want to uh, be above the requirement that the given loads are held. So uh, the minimum solution is, is what you're seeing here. And uh, computing this bridge uh, will be one of the examples that will, you will see in the, in the exercises that you will solve practically with your own hands and on your own computers. A second category of optimization problems is to maximize performance. So um, the, in the lower example, what you see here, uh, this is uh, taken from a publication that tries to find trajectories to send out a satellite as far out from our solar system as possible. So they have a certain budget of, of fuel that they can load onto the, the rocket and the satellite. And the question is, with their given budget of fuel, uh, what is the best trajectory? How can they maybe slingshot around the sun and so on to give as, most, uh, most, as much speed as possible to the satellite? And here we are now maximizing performance under the constraint of, of some cost. And this is also very common in, in engineering. We can also trade off between these two. So there can be situations where you say you are accepting, you accept willing more performance for a given cost uh, and uh, somehow you have weights. So you say that much more performance is okay for that much more cost. And uh, this is the, uh, the third example here, the cost performance trade-off. And um, there the big question is how do we do the trade-off and uh, is there maybe some alpha involved where we can give a weight to the cost and, and how is this selected. So far we have seen problems that were more or less static. So we, we look at our problem or we look at the world, we cast it in an optimization problem, we solve that, we apply that and then it holds forever so to speak. But there are also domains where we have to be really fast in taking decisions. And one of the domains where we need to be really fast is in control. So control in the sense, in Germany you would say Regelungstechnik, where you have to take decisions um, that impact uh, a dynamic system at runtime. And uh, the first example I'd like to show you is here this inverted pendulum. And what you see in the video is that the pendulum is swinging up and the pendulum is held upright and as you can imagine a human is not even possible to swing up the pendulum let alone keep it upright uh, but a computer is and uh, for this the computer many times per second is solving an optimization problem to compute his best movements so the computer solves the problem of his best movements it is uh, then executing the first steps and then is waiting or then is receiving additional input. So there are, of course, external random inputs that uh, are perturbing the, the actual behavior. So there is there's a loop where the, the controller or the computer uh, receives new measurements about the current system state. So the position and the speed of the different angles and so on. Then is doing an optimization, is applying the results, and then the loop continues with new measurements, new optimization, applying the results and so on. And this happens many hundreds to thousands of times per second, and therefore we perceive it as a fluid behavior. And this is um, what optimum control is doing, and uh, the, the scientific term for this is model predictive control. So we have a model that we can use to predict the future, and then we can optimize our actions in this um, model simulation and apply it back into the real world. Another example here on the left side, this is the autonomous control of, an, of a small um, radio controlled vehicle and as you see uh, the car is really drifting around the corners and is uh, always driving on, on the perfect line and so on and uh, this is possible because he's planning ahead and he knows when the curve is coming 
and is doing a constant optimization, uh, knowing it, uh, the, the current state of the car itself and of its environment. So these are all optimization problems and uh, optimization problems of this type will also be solved in the practical exercises of, of this lecture or of the course, not, not today. Another domain that we will see in the course later on is computer vision. And um, it might seem unintuitive, but many problems that are solved in computer vision are also optimization problems or can be expressed as optimization problems. The first of which I want to talk about here is um, stereo matching. So stereo matching is um, the question when you take two pictures that are a couple of centimeters apart, um, like the human eyes are a couple of human centimeters apart, by the deviation of the pixels between the two images, can you figure out how far away the objects are on the images? So this is stereo matching. And what is done is um, the, you define a so-called energy function and the energy function describes how close the model prediction or the, the depth image that you compute, how close it corresponds with the deviation between the two images and uh, the energy function is to be minimized. We, we try to find a configuration of minimum energy. So this is, has an origin in, in physics where also systems try to get into a, a minimum energy state and here this is a, an analogon to that and uh, we solve the optimization problem to get to the minimum energy state and you see depicted that actually the, the scene and the depth of the scene was, was recovered quite nicely for this case. So this is a very famous example, it's called uh, Tsuguba from, from Japan. Another example is image denoising. In a similar way, we can construct an energy function, minimize that, and then recover uh, um, an image that is denoised that resembles more closely to, to what we expect um, um, to be the ground truth behind the, the noisy image. And then the last example, the last example is image deblurring, and this is also something that might seem unintuitive. We can actually invert the blur that has been applied to an image. So do not confound this with uh, maybe some unrealistic um, movies where the, the, the FBI or the CIA can zoom into an image and uh, where there's a pixelated image and they can zoom in infinitely and then find out the, the face of the gangster and so on. This is not possible. If you have a pixelated image, it's really difficult to recover anything. But if the image is blurry, then oftentimes this is an invertible operation and we can find out by which operation the image has been blurred and then we can apply the, the inverse operation. And um, also image deblurring will be an example that at the end of this course you will be able to, to implement for yourself. Now optimization as we have seen it so far, uh, these were all man-made models and man-made problems that were solved but also optimization happens quite naturally in the physical world so there are quite a few examples where nature is doing an optimization uh, without any human involvement or human um, um, invention uh, for example light is always traveling the fastest path and depending on the um, the, the speed that light can travel in a certain material, uh, it will take a slightly different path and um, uh, this is called Fermat's principle and you see this quite nicely on the uh, image with the straw and the glass. Another example are soap films. So if you uh, create a soap bubble or a soap film, it will return to a shape of minimum surface because there is a surface tension and it wants to reduce to the minimum uh, surface. This has been used, for example, by Frei Otto in his very famous design of the Munich Olympic Park. And um, actually, this is a quite difficult optimization problem. And uh, nature is doing this without thinking about it, quote unquote. The last example that you see on the right side, uh, this is energy minimization for protein folding. So the proteins in well, your body, for example, DNA, they are folding in a way that the free energy 
is, is minimized. It wants to get into a very stable state where all the energy has been dissipated. And um, the, the problem here is that there are many, many different ways that a protein can, can fold. And nature is finding a way to get to this minimum energy state. And for humans, it's actually very difficult. So there are large computational programs where people try to find out what are the actual foldings of certain proteins to characterize their properties. And they need really years and years of CPU time to do this computation for one protein because there are so many different folds possible and nature is doing this quite easily and, and, and really fast. So optimization happens every day around you and um, well it's actually a, more a principle that we can use. Now have a look, let's have a look at the, the very big picture of what we will see in this course. So this slide, it contains the, basically the entire course, everything that we will see in the, in the coming lectures. So what we are interested in is to optimize a certain objective function. So here, and this is called f of x. And um, well, the optimization, we can cast it as a minimization or as a maximization. The two are equivalent because it can take just the negative of um, a function to switch from a minimization to a maximization. Well, usually we will see a minimization if it's not strongly suggested by the application example that we want to maximize something. So here we are minimizing and um, the notation here, this argmin, it returns the argument that is minimizing f. So in that case, the, the minimizer is x star and uh, for, for this input f achieves its, its lowest point. And the idea behind convexity is that if a function is convex then it has only one minimizer. So if it's strictly convex then a function has only one minimizer and that is unique. And in this course at the very end we will see some different examples but mainly we are handling convex optimization problems because they have nice properties that can be exploited then in algorithms that we that we develop um, for, for, for solving the actual optimization problems. So we care about convexity because it has only one minimizer and because when we want to find this minimizer we can just well quote unquote walk downhill. Uh, here you see on the left side a convex function. This one is good. We want to have convex functions. On the right hand side, uh, this is a non-convex function. And as you can imagine, we would need many, many more um, um, examples that we take or uh, samples that we, that, we, that we take from the, the domain in order to find the minimum. And uh, you will find out that the convexity, it looks easy here. But if you go into problems of very high dimensionality, then a lot of things can be expressed by convex functions. And there is a large well, bag of tricks to approximate real life optimization problems that are maybe not convex from the start uh, with a convex optimization problem and also have bounds to say how close we can get to the actual solution of maybe a non-convex original optimization problem. So convexity is uh, the name of the game and uh, we will see a more mathematical, a more formal definition of convexity later today in the course. There's a hierarchy by, of optimization problems and um, the example that you saw initially with the Stickler diet, this is a so-called linear programming problem. And uh, this is today one of the easiest optimization problems that we, that we know about. And then going up in the hierarchy, the linear optimization problem is still contained. So we, we, we open the space of possible optimization problems. And um, uh, at the end, we then have so-called conic problems. Um, this is where we will end in this course with the conic optimization problems that contain everything, every level below. So semi-definite programming, second order cone programming, quadratic programming. These are all terms that might sound difficult, but you will get to learn them gradually over this course. And then in the end, we will have a small outlook also on non-convex non optimization problems um, at the very end of, of the course. 
So the solution techniques that are developed are exploiting as much structure of the problems as possible. And for the LP, so the easiest problem, we have the most structure that we can exploit and the fastest solution algorithms that can be designed. And then going up in the hierarchy, uh, we have more and we have less and less uh, exploitable structure and therefore the algorithms are also generally getting slower um, but uh, the algorithms are getting faster every year and there has been a huge development that has happened over the last 25 to 30 years so we are many orders of magnitudes faster today than we were a couple of years back and that means that also a lot of specialized solution techniques that some application domains might have developed today they are completely replaced by some of the general optimization tools that um, we will uh, see later in the course so here you see a graph that shows this explosion of efficiency of the optimization software so uh, this comes from cplex cplex is a software package by ibm and uh, they have been um, starting this graph in the early 1990s and then what you see here as, a, as the blue columns is the version to version improvement. So from one release, from one software release of IBM Cplex to the next, how much faster are the algorithms on the benchmark problems? So the benchmark problems, they contain very difficult problems obviously and um, uh, what you see here is that Quite astonishingly, over many years, they had uh, a times three, a times five, a times nearly ten improvement in the speed of the algorithms, and this is accumulating. So you have to multiply these um, imp these uh, speed improvements in order to get the the cumulative speed up. And in a span of maybe ten years overall, there was a thirty thousand times speed up just on the algorithm side. And in addition to that. Hardware became also better in the 1990s, so by about a factor of 1000. That means overall we had a 30 million times speed up. So that means a problem that in the early 2000s could be solved within seconds would have taken months or even years in the early 1990s. And um, some of the scientific fields and also engineering practices were uh, a little bit late in uh, jumping on the bandwagon uh, but now many have discovered that if they use the commercial and also the open source uh, optimization packages uh, many problems that were totally out of reach a couple of years before can be solved quite efficiently today.